is still found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. That is the background for this teaching series through this season of Lent. The one that I'm going to pivot around is going to be found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. But let's start with the background. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice from heaven said, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And then moving down to Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Since then we have a great, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we do have one in every respect who has been tested as we are, yet is without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our times of need. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. For Jesus' time being pushed out into the wilderness by the Spirit... It was a time of complete dependence upon God. His experience in the wilderness echoes the story of a very similar experience the Israelites went through when they were freed from their slavery in Egypt. The people of God were in the Sinai wilderness for 40 years, and during that time, God gave them what they needed, and only what they needed, to get through each and every day. God could have provided at once manna and everything else that the Israelites needed for their wanderings up front, but he didn't do that. Instead, God gave them enough for one day. This was a perpetual lesson being taught to the Israelites, not just dependence to survive the day by day, but to get into the habit of depending on God so they would openly acknowledge that all life comes from God. And it is God who provides the good things that we need. So each day brought them to a new reminder of their utter dependence on God and the gift of their daily bread that was made from manna, a substance we have yet to define. I love God's mysteries. Jesus teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And it is here that Jesus is telling us that every day we should acknowledge who the source of everything in our life is. Jesus is teaching us how to acknowledge our dependence on God each and every day, allowing us to live not only in God's embrace, but also his providence, his wisdom, and his protection. I remember one man and his family in a church I served many years ago. He and his wife had three children, two boys and a young disabled girl with many medical needs. He quite suddenly lost his job and was unemployed for quite some time. He shared with me that during that time he learned to live daily in a way he never had before. The church as a body and various members of the church body individually helped that family for several months as they struggled along. Sometimes they literally did not know where their next meal was coming from. But with each day was a new day, and God provided through the generosity of God's people. I remember he told me that the Lord's Prayer had a new meaning for him. 
For the first time in his life, he really understood what it, to, what it meant to pray, give us our daily bread. God gives us what we need in the wilderness times of our lives. When we recognize that we are literally running on empty, our physical strength, our emotional resources, and mental activity we use to assess our daily needs are simply at an end. It is there that we learn to be dependent upon God, not when we're able to live in a time of surplus and plenty. Isaiah 40, 31 teaches us that God renews our strength so we can run and not be weary, so we can walk and not faint. The Bible is filled with images that call to mind the benefits of our acknowledgement of our dependence upon God, and I believe it is good. Now, let me rephrase that. I actually believe it is necessary to meditate on these images, whether in the wilderness or so we never forget that all the gifts and abilities we have, the success we experience in our lives, the joy of family and friends, our homes that we live in, the food that we eat, the standard of health that we possess, all of that is provided by an all-knowing and all-loving God. God sometimes is characterized as our shepherd. Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, and we learn that we are his sheep, which makes us his flock because Scripture constantly characterizes us being more like sheep than any other creature. The people of God are not like aardvarks. When we have problems, we can't roll into our shell and have everything be okay. We're like sheep who need protection. One of the reasons a sheep must have a keeper in that case. Now, after centuries of a domesticated herd, sheep lack the instincts to defend themselves against a wolf or coyote or lion or bear or any other type of predatory animal. They are simply dependent upon a shepherd who protects them from the dangers around them, even from themselves, meaning their own self-destructive stupidity. Our American culture teaches us that dependence on anyone or anything is bad, and independence, in other words, complete self-care, complete self-control, is good. It kind of goes against the teachings of Scripture a little bit. Most of the people that I know, and the struggles that I have in my own ego, simply does not like to think of myself or anything else to be dependent when I faced my own times in the wilderness with the power and ability and resources that I can no longer get through of who I am and what I am, sometimes I, like many others, am too proud to acknowledge the weakness of my limitations and admit that I need God not only in my life, but in the source of my living, both in this world and for the next. Acknowledging our dependence upon God is vital in recognizing who is able, who inaugurates, who works out the plan of providence to meet our needs. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine. You, the dependent sheep, are the branches. This means that our strength and our sustenance comes from outside of ourselves. It comes from our connection to the source of light and life, God Almighty. In their summer of 88, I had the pleasure of spending some time in England and in Scotland. And while I was in London, I went to the Hampton Court Palace near London, and there I found the living grapevine that was planted in 1768. Have any of you all ever heard of this? Oh, wow. And so many of you being plant people. Some of its branches are 200 feet long. It's from a single root, and this single root at that time was two feet in diameter. Because of skillful cutting and pruning, that one vine produces more than 600 pounds of black grapes every year, and although some of the smaller branches are 200 feet from the main stem, 
They bear plenty of fruit because they are joined to the vine and allow the life of the vine to flow through them. We, like the branches and in our connection to grow in our understanding of Jesus, must recognize our dependence on Jesus, who is dependent on God for life in its fullness. We draw our life from him. We bear fruit in his name. We are shaped by him so our gifts may have the greatest impact of effectiveness in growing the kingdom by living and sharing the gospel. The Apostle Paul understood this very, very well. His strength to endure, to survive, and thrive in his wilderness experiences from his ministries that came from outside of himself, so that in Philippians 4.13, he said, I can do all things through who? Once again. Who strengthens me. It wasn't his training as a Pharisee. It wasn't the fact that he was able to travel abroad. It wasn't the fact that he was able to speak at least five languages fluently and converse on a number of different levels of philosophy. It was Christ strengthening him. The book of Hebrews teaches us that Jesus Christ is our great high priest and that we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness and who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet they are without sin. He then says, let us therefore approach the throne of of grace with boldness so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace in help of our time of need. Is that passage clear? Because I find reading Hebrews sometimes to be a bit confusing because there are images and there are items that are talked about that the hearers of that century would understand, but here in 21st century America of a postmodern era, it gets a little muddled. You see, in our tradition of faith, we have pastors. And the role of a pastor is to not take your sins your wrongdoings, your mistakes, and on my shoulders where I act as an intercessory between God and you all, and so the pastor comes along beside, companions with you in the journey to help you, guide you, steer you, discover what God is saying and what God is doing in your lives, how God is calling you to grow, act, react, be. That is different from the concept of a priest. Priests are handpicked by God. Pastors are called by God. But in the Jewish sense, if my father was a priest, I would become a priest. Because his father's, my father's father's was a priest. And my father's father's father was a priest. And you can trace that all the way back to the line of Aaron in the wilderness When God said to Moses, Aaron and his descendants will serve as your high priests. They will take on the spiritual responsibility for the people in their midst. In the Catholic sense, in the Anglican sense, in the Lutheran sense, we call that parish episcopacy. In other words, whoever lives in the area of that church, that priest is spiritually responsible for but they don't have to come and engage you. They can do it from a distance. They don't have to do it alongside. Our concept of a priest from the Catholic tradition specifically, you know, they're supposed to avoid sin. And if they have sin, they go to confession. But they really shouldn't have a whole lot of it. But there is no priest called by God out of humanity who is without sin other than Jesus. And that's the point the writer of Hebrews is making. Here is a man who was totally born of the flesh, for he was born from Mary, but he is also totally of the Spirit, for he was sired by God. 
He had an understanding of what temptation was from his time in the wilderness, of being hungry, of being thirsty, of not sure how he would get through the next moment. He understood rejection by the crowds, for when he started his ministry, they, they ignored him, they defied him, they tried to get rid of him so many different times. He understood what it means to have his family say, you're making us look bad, you need to shape up. He understands what it means to look at those who are broken and hurt of society and understand God's love and compassion for them that applies to them, not just those who appear to have it all together. Jesus gets it because he's been there. And what got him through each and every time wasn't the cleverness of his mind. It wasn't the unique situation that would just pop up out of nowhere. It was a declaration that God is leading his life and he will depend on God to get him through that life, giving him what he needs every day. Jesus needed to eat and drink to survive, just like we do. Each and every day, God would give Jesus what he would need. And all that Jesus did was keep pointing us back to what it means to have a relationship with God, not following rules and rituals that the Jews had established at this time, not following all the elements of doctrinal and dogmatic principles that are put out by various church cultures today, but to have a relationship one-on-one with a source who will guarantee us our daily bread, food, shelter, protection, wisdom, strength, even places of rest, all of those we need to survive. Jesus understood that. And because he understood that, and because he had committed no sins, like every other human priest into Hebrews up to that point, and everyone who's been called a priest from that point onward, Jesus was perfect. Can you imagine getting through a day without sinning? I know I can't. A day where you're not inappropriately angry at someone for something that they didn't do, or something you've blown out of proportion. A day when you didn't reinterpret the speed limits to be more appropriate for your being late. A day when you didn't allow someone to go in front of you in line. A day when the person at the cash register gave you too much change back and you didn't give them their surplus. It's all these small little things, but anything that we put our priority above someone else or before God is a sin. I one time tried to record all my sins in a day, just a common day. I stopped counting after 25. I was a bit embarrassed. Every one of those places, I believed my brain was smarter than God's brain. I believed my strength was greater than God's strength. I believed my wisdom was greater than God's wisdom. And I could just go down that list. I'm thinking I'm better than the one who created the heavens and the earth. Whoa. Talk about not acknowledging the powerful presence of a providential God. Because in the way that God carried Jesus through his wilderness, carried him through his ministry, touched the hearts and minds of the people whom Jesus brought God to, the way that he faced his, the sham of his arrest, the, un, the lack of necessity of his scourging, and then that time on the cross and God was with him every step of the way. And if he did that for Jesus and Jesus did that on our behalf, why can't we stop and acknowledge it? 
not merely acknowledging that God is there, but that we need God to get through each and every day. It's that element of dependence. And sometimes admitting that we are weak, that we can't get through, that we have a situation of life that we're thoroughly unprepared for. That's the working definition of a crisis, by the way. How on earth are we going to get through this? Hello, God will be there and show you the way. But admitting that dependence is admitting a weakness and and admitting something that we can't do. And for some reason, our egos struggle within that. But the beautiful thing about admitting our dependence, acknowledging the necessity to rely on God, is that is when God fills us, provides for us, reveals his beauty and glory and plan, and gives us peace so we're not overwhelmed by the wilderness experiences in our lives, nor do we sit there arrogantly and say, bring it on. We're able to look at it and say, God will be with me every step of the way. That's not because God has always been there. God will always be there. But we've stopped and we've recognized it. We've acknowledged it. We've allowed ourselves to give in to the fact that we don't have it all, to handle it all, and realize that God is showering us with blessings so that we can move forward. The great high priest wasn't great because he was the son of God, which, that's a pretty amazing claim to have. The great high priest, Jesus the Christ, was great because in each and every circumstance that he faced, he stopped and acknowledged how much he needed his Father to get him through. And that's when we see the miracles. That's when we see the healings. It is through that that we're able to stand here and say we are children of God because of the resurrection. And Lent, this time that we're going through, should make us stop and think, ooh, how much am I really letting God be in control? How much am I really letting God guide me and lead me? And how much am I trusting this guidance and leadership? And, and, and how much am I letting others see that? How much am I tripping over my ego because I don't need to? I just to admit that I ain't all that and a bag of chips. And that my God loves me despite the fact that I have an ego the size of Texas. He'll forgive me for it. He'll bless me. He'll guide me. Because my God loves me. Because our God loves us. And by being an example of acknowledging our weakness and our dependence upon God, for the world to see that is how the good news is truly spread. Will you all pray with me, please? Lord, it is so easy to stop and admit all the places where we mess up, screw up, and otherwise choose not to follow you. And even in that act of self-loathing, we are not acknowledging our dependence because we confess nothing to you. We just merely admit it to ourselves. But help us in our times of prayers and meditation. In the wildernesses, both big and small, that we face each and every day, to simply stop and say to you, God... I need you 
because I don't know how to get through this. I am not strong enough. I am not smart enough. But I know you are. Allow us to be thankful in our petitions so that we may be thankful in the blessings and joy that you give us. Help us to acknowledge so we can become dependent and in that dependence have a peaceful strength that only comes from you because you are the God who provides. Help us to celebrate that in your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. I would ask that no one go sit in that front pew in the middle for a while and so on the floor. What was the first thing you might find when I took the water over? Don't we have enough of these things for us? Right there. I mean, the past. And I'm not stopping learning about belief. It's that simple to not acknowledge God. It is that easy. But the thing that we have to remember is if we can stop and acknowledge that, then in that moment we are turning, confessing. Grace and peace and presence is going to us. It's not an element of self loathing. It's an element of allowing God to reveal to us how He sees us. It's giving to us. It's loving us. It's guiding us. It's taking us to become the people He has created us to be. People that embodies grace, people that have shared his glory. Now, people that can take hope to those who have none. All this starts with acknowledging what we are about. So, as you go from this place, as you take what you heard, as you go and have a fellowship meal, Think about what you've heard. Think about what you've felt. And the Spirit calls you to apply some of it to your life, but please do not be afraid to let the world around you know that y'all are people of God. As you go, be filled with the peace of the world see the grace. Thank you.